Greetings, everyone. I'm Carol Queen, and I'm the founding director of the Center for Sex and Culture. My partner, Robert, and I co-founded this entity long ago, and uh, I'm really very honored and delighted to be part of this panel and to MC for us tonight as we launch the Prostasia Foundation. Um, the logo is back behind me. I want to introduce you to the center just briefly. Uh, so you know where you are. I think you all know where you are, but here's the Center for Sex and Culture, the library, the gallery, the audience, the archives back there, and uh, we have been collecting materials from the sexuality communities, trying to hold important papers, books and periodicals, and we do all kinds of things here. If you want to use the center for your own thing, you can, unless it involves lighting things on fire, in which case we will suggest that you go to a concrete building, because this is old wood and books. But other than that, pretty much anything goes at the center. So, uh, so we were really delighted to have uh, to have this event. If you are looking for restrooms, you're going to find them in the lobby and over at this point to my left. Uh, and if you want to know more about the center, you can ask me after and I can give you more information. Uh, but that's enough of that for right now. I'm really, really delighted to introduce Jeremy Malcolm to you, who I believe is the impresario and the fine mind behind this foundation. He will tell you a lot more about it, I think. And I'd also like to tell the speakers that if you would like a glass of water, maybe uh, Jeremy would be willing to pass this over to you, should you. Should you need one? So I'm going to turn my microphone off right now and let Jeremy tell you what he wants you to know about Postalia and what we're going to do tonight. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, and thank you for coming out here on a Wednesday evening. There don't seem to be too many people of us in the audience, but don't worry because uh, we're also recording these presentations and they will go online. So um, there will be an audience in the potentially millions, I want to say, <laughs> <laughs> once we go online. Um, so I don't have too many administrative announcements. I do have one small thank you um, to the Free Speech Coalition for their sponsorship of the refreshments tonight. Uh, so thank you very much for them, uh, for that. Um, I am now going to launch into a brief presentation. Now, since it is a Wednesday evening, you've probably already spent your day watching PowerPoint presentations and you have no desire to watch another one. <laughs> However, I am going to make you watch another one. It is going to be short, though, I promise you. So, introducing Prostasia Foundation, um, uh, Carol pronounced it slightly differently. I don't know how it's meant to be pronounced because it's a Greek word and I'm not Greek. If anyone in the audience is Greek, they can correct me. I've been calling it Prostasia Foundation. Prostasia means protection because we are a child protection organisation. Um, but we are a child protection organisation with a difference. And if you're here tonight, you probably have um, a little inkling of some of the things that make Prostasia Foundation different. And um, the three values that we represent here are at the core of that. So at the top, of course, child protection, because otherwise we wouldn't be a child protection organisation. Um, we are here to prevent child sexual abuse, including the uh, distribution or uh, possession of uh, child sexual abuse imagery. Um, but we also want to do this in a way that upholds human and civil rights, that's our second value, and which is sex positive, that's our third value. Now, having these three values um, on a diagram like that is kind of abstract, so I want to make it a bit more concrete for you and to point out five positions that Prostasia holds which maybe some other organisations in this space might not hold or might not place in the same um, priority that we do. So let's uh, start looking at those five things that Prostasia believes. Number one, that child protection is important enough that it should never be used as a pretext to achieve other political objectives. Now this is something that happens a lot. Um, this is a famous cartoon that I've loved for a long while. Um, which just goes to demonstrate that whenever there are laws for the repression of online speech, it's usually wrapped up as a child protection measure or as an anti-terrorism measure. Now, that's not to say that those aren't 
Um, sometimes uh, leg there aren't legitimate measures that be can be taken um, for child protection and, and the elimination of terrorism. Of course there are, and that's what we're all about, at least the former of those. Um, but often these laws really are not effective to do anything other than um, the, uh, the, the background motive. Um, so in the case of SESTA, uh, or FOSTA oh. as it's now known, um, which President Trump is signing into law right there, um, the real motivation behind this law was not to prevent child sex trafficking, but to, um, uh, to as an attack on sex work in general, consensual adult sex work, and its expression online, and the speech of uh, sex workers online. So we'll be hearing a little more from uh, David Green a little later, about the lawsuit that's been brought to overturn Foster um, and what the constitutional grounds are for doing that. Um, another law that you probably don't know so much about, um, but which is being promoted by an organization called the Campaign Against Sex Robots, is a law called CREPA, uh, or the CREPA Act. Um, now, the motivation of this group and, and the others along with them is to uh, make all uh, sex toy, uh, sex robots or um, dolls unlawful, but they're starting with ones that can that bear a resemblance to minors, um, because they know that that's where they can get the most traction. But their, their ultimate aim, and they admit this, is that all sex toys that look like human bodies should be outlawed. Um, so our position on these things is, well, let's actually do some research first to find out if these are harmful as you're claiming they are or not. And so Prostasia's really primary objective, if anything, is um, the prevention of child sexual abuse through research into um, the best, most effective and most constitutional ways of, um, uh, of achieving that. So um, we actually have a research proposal that we're going to be trying to raise some funds for um, to look into this issue of sex dolls. Do sex dolls or robots um, reduce the incidence of child sexual abuse or do they increase it? That's a, a question that has to be answered, either yes or no, right? But the Creeper Act is, is sort of assuming the answer before the research is there. So we're just saying, let's do the research first. And, uh, and based on what we find out, we can then make policy rather than making policy first and doing the research later, if at all. So, uh, and another act uh, in California, in fact, that we're supporting is one that would make um, California's uh, sex offender laws um, more fact-based. And this particular amendment, uh, this particular act would amend the law um, to uh, include minors who offend sexually. Um, what is their recidivism? What is their p potential to be... Um, how can we put them through the criminal justice, justice system in a way that does the least harm to victims, but also to the juveniles themselves, who are, in this case, the offenders? So um, research is definitely one of the most important things um, that we want to try and promote. Number three, the communities that are wrongly blamed for child sexual abuse can be vital allies in, its fight, in the fight towards its elimination. And in this, I'm referring to the communities of sex workers, kingsters. We'll be hearing uh, something about how both of those communities can contribute towards um, the elimination of child sexual abuse. But also the internet industry, I think, has been stigmatized um, in, in a lot of respects as being responsible for child sex trafficking. And we would rather than attack these communities and industries, we would rather bring them on board as partners. That's why the uh, Free Speech Coalition is here tonight. Um, that's why we have representatives from um, the sex positive communities here tonight. Um, we think, look, if you're trying to um, pre prevent children from being abused, these people are your allies. They don't want children to be abused. They want sex to be something that adults enjoy. They want um, adult entertainment to be something that um, the children are, are not drawn into. So of course you want to have these people on your side. And it's really surprising that no other child protection organisation really sees this and will paint the excuse me will paint these groups as the enemy. So that's one of the, the things that our approach um, is uh, is different from the other organisations in this space. Um, and as an example, for one of the other organisations that um, kind of holds the view that um, I don't know if you can really see this, but 
The National Centre for on Sexual Exploitation is a group that tries to draw links between pornography, prostitution, even sexting here, and then, as if it's a natural consequence, they, they link that to child sexual abuse, um, to child pornography, to sexualization of children. So what we want to do is to really question those links. And we think, if we want to question those links, um, if we want to be serious about it, we have to be talking to those communities. We have to have the adult entertainment industry on board um, to, to discuss and, and to, to look at this in an evidence-based fashion. Because if we try and leave them to the side, we're not going to be able to solve the problem. Um, and these links, if they do exist, are just going to remain obscure. So we need to, to look at this with an open mind. Another example of how we're doing this is we're convening a um, gathering of internet platforms, uh, which will probably take place next year at this rate, um, but we're going to be bringing internet platforms together. Welcome, come in. <laughs> uh, serve yourself drinks, you haven't missed too much. Um, there's also food there. <laughs> um, Yes, we're going to be bringing internet platforms with experts from the mental health profession, um, from the sex industry, to talk about, look, how can they best manage their platforms in a way that upholds freedom of expression but also protects children. And we think that this has to be an inclusive conversation if it's going to achieve its object. So we're three down, two to go. Number four, protecting children from sexual harm must include protecting them from the harmful effects of laws that are meant to help them. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, despite the stereotypes that we often hear, sometimes minors, juveniles, are in fact responsible for some acts of child sexual abuse. You see here 35% at the bottom of this diagram, 35% of child sexual abuse is actually committed by juveniles. So we want to stop that, we want to prevent that, but we don't want to necessarily have you know, 15, 16 year olds are listed on the sex offender registry for the rest of their lives so that they can't find employment, they can't find a place to live. Um, there are harms on both sides of this equation. There are harms that um, juvenile offenders can suffer as well as their victims. So prevention is something that needs to work for offenders and for survivors or victims. Um, in a particular way that children themselves are criminalised and stigmatised is sexting. Now, sexting, researchers tell us, is a de developmentally normal um, part of growing up. Uh, for young adolescents, they will engage in sexting. We can't really stop them from doing it. We can educate them about the risks. We can tell them not to share photos that they don't have consent to share but we shouldn't be sending them to jail, we shouldn't be listing them on a sex offender registry. So this is an example of how taking this sex positive approach um, to child protection means not only protecting them from sexual abuse, but also protecting them from laws that are meant to be helping them. And number five, and this really encapsulates everything that I've said so far, is that our objective is the prevention of child sexual abuse um, rather than trying to mop up afterwards, which of course is um, a less preferable option. Um, so we have a diverse um, group who've come together sharing these beliefs. Here are some of our um, directors and advisors. I haven't been able to list them all because it's a small slide, but if you pick up our brochure, you can uh, uh, read about some of the others. And two of our advisors who are not listed on this slide will be speaking to you tonight so you'll be able to hear a little from them. Um, and uh, again, sort of reflecting back all of the things that I've been talking about, here are the ways in which Prostasia Foundation will be operating. Um, we will be helping to fund sound scientific research on child sexual abuse prevention. Um, there is a massive deficit of uh, funding for research. There's also a stigma that attaches to researchers. Researchers are often um, criticised for doing very important work to help us to understand why people sexually offend and what can be done to prevent them from offending. Um, engaging with diverse stakeholders, as I already mentioned, uh, we want to bring in those communities that are normally sidelined in these conversations or even stigmatised and, and blamed for child sexual abuse when in fact they are our very important allies in the prevention of child sexual abuse. We address the human rights impacts of child protection laws and policies and we communicate the results of this research and engagement to the broader community and to policymakers. So that is something 
um, that no other organisation is, do is doing uh, in the way that we do it, and that's why Prostasia Foundation has been formed. And so we thank you very much for your support. Um, you can help us further by following us on Twitter and Facebook. You can visit our website. You can subscribe to our newsletter. You don't have to be a member to subscribe to the newsletter. That's free. But if you'd like to be become a member, that would be awesome. Um, we have several levels of membership. Uh, there's details on the, um, on the notice board outside, and you can also find the details on our website. For those who are attached to organisations, you can also ask your organisation to sponsor us. Um, we have, because of the, the whole stigma that surrounds this area, it is a difficult one to raise funds to support. Um, I am approaching larger donors and foundations, but every little bit counts. So if you can talk to your organisation about sponsoring us, that would mean a lot. Um, I think I've taken up about uh, 10 minutes of your time, so I am going to hand back to Carol. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Carol. Jeremy, thank you so much. I am uh, especially honored to be part of this event tonight because my doctorate comes from the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality, where I first learned the term sex positive, and where I worked with some pretty amazing academics who were interested in this topic and were clear-eyed about looking at it. So, so this is the first organized entity that I have seen in the almost 30 years since I first began engaging with these ideas uh, that wants to take some of that insight and bring it forward. And it, I, it's, it's super moving to me. And I just want to say something about the term sex positive. Uh, I believe that you are using it correctly, unlike <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> so may I just say to the millions of people who are watching our <laughs> online presentation that sex positive has come to, to, to sort of take on the, the, the energy of Which, yay, <laughs> if you do, who could argue with that? That's lovely. It doesn't mean, though, that that's the definition of sex positive. Sex positive seeks to look at a culture that would give everyone in a diverse way what they need to live their best sexual life. And this is not a sex negative, uh, and this is not a sex positive culture, it's a sex negative one, and one's own personal enthusiasm about sex is both protected and, and honored by sex positivity as it originally was, was defined, but not required because virgins can be sex positive, asexual people can be sex positive, anyone can think that we all deserve the right resources and the right shame-free environment to grow in our sexuality, whatever that looks like. Just in case that's useful to people hearing, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you keep saying sex positive, I thought that meant we. <laughs> Yay, you. But no, that's not what it really means. All right, I'll take up no more of your time right now. I'm uh, honored now to introduce to you David Green, who is going to speak about the aforementioned SESTA and FOSTA, I believe. David, please take Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to, uh, so I'm David Green, I'm the Civil Liberties Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and uh, I am one of the lawyers who is, thank you, uh, I am one of the lawyers uh, who is working on the legal challenge to the constitutionality of FOSTA, the um, Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, I think there are a few other words in there as well. Um, which was which which um, which is not an appropriate name uh, because it really it it, uh, it it targets much more than sex trafficking. But as Jeremy says, it's actually a very good example of where a, a legitimate concern for something we all think is bad, um, sex trafficking, um, uh, was used uh, it was 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 at best hijacked by others um, uh, to pass a law that is that really stigmatizes and criminalizes a lot of um, uh, activity and uh, speech about sex uh, that has absolutely nothing to do um, with trafficking at all. So the law itself uh, was signed by President Trump in April. It made three, uh, three changes to existing law. 
Um, Prior, there, there was you know, sex trafficking and, and the law defined, sex trafficking even before FOSTA was illegal. Um, it, uh, sex trafficking is defined under the law as being uh, offering of sexual services for commercial purposes, um, either uh, of minors um, or of adults through force, fraud, or coercion. So that's what they, that's what's meant by sex trafficking. And I think you know, we can, at least for the purposes of moving forward, we can agree that that's a bad thing and that can be, that can be criminalized. Um, and that was already illegal. And what else was illegal uh, from a fairly recent law, uh, only about four years old, um, was that you could not, it was also a federal criminal law to knowingly um, advertise for sex trafficking. Um, and not even just to advertise service yourself, but also to be an internet platform that knowingly carried those, those types of advertisements. Um, and there was a, a and, but what FOSTA was, a lar the momentum behind uh, FOSTA was a frustration that some felt with being able to uh, bring lawsuits specifically against Backpage.com, um, which um, many people uh, attribute, and, and I'm and I not in a position to challenge whether this is true or false, but as a, as a, as a major form for where sex trafficking um, was happening. And uh, those who were victims were finding it difficult to prove that Backpage sort of actually knew that it was carrying uh, sex trafficking, and so they found that this was some frustration of the law. It, it's completely, it's inaccurate to say that there was never a successful lawsuit against Backpage. There actually were some. Um, but uh, there also were some high-profile ones that weren't successful in this, this and this, that was the impetus to pass the law. But the law that was passed actually goes much far beyond a law that's written to make sure Backpage and sites that are just like it are held accountable. Um, the major change the law made um, was to create a whole brand new federal criminal law which, um, which, makes it, um, which makes it a crime to own or operate an online, interactive online service um, with the intent to facilitate or promote the prostitution of another person. That does not require uh, minors that does not require the lack of consent. That completely that applies um, completely to um, adult consensual um, prostitution. Uh, the law also does not define what it means to promote or facilitate. Um, so it's unclear uh, what's actually illegal. Whether this is actually just you know, pimping, as you might consider that, or whether it's doing other things that might promote or or facilitate. Facilitating the law just means to make easier, you know, to make uh, the prostitution of another person easier. So that's a major change. Uh, that FOSTA did. As part of that, it actually, there's fairly onerous penalties, five years in prison, large fines uh, if you violate that law. And those penalties get even worse um, if you can show that you uh, promote or facilitate the prostitution of five or more persons, or um, if you did it with a reckless disregard of that you were um, contributing to sex trafficking. And again, what it means to contribute to sex trafficking, um, no one the, the, the law doesn't say. The reason why Congress gave, why, it's, why it has this whole law that really that only has a very minor link to sex trafficking was a congressional finding that um, sex work and sex trafficking were inherently, or I'm sorry, were inextricably linked. And that was Congress's belief that you couldn't, that um, wherever there was sex work, well, they don't use the term sex work, they use the term prostitution, um, and you can, certainly can take them to task for that. Um, but you know, that, that wherever there was prostitution, there was going to be sex trafficking. So you had to have, a, in order to fight sex trafficking, you had to necessarily um, fight uh, prostitution as well. There is a defense in the law that says, well, if you're only offering your services a place where it's legal, then that's a defense. But you know, when you're using an online service, it's actually quite difficult to, 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 to decide where you're offering um, your service. Um, so that was one major change. Other major change the law made was that it took the existing sex trafficking law, um, which required knowledge of, uh, at least for advertisements, knowledge that you were um, carrying advertisements for sex trafficking. Um, and there was another part of the law that made it illegal, with, not with respect to advertising, but for otherwise being for what they called participating in a venture of sex trafficking. And yes, and again, this was this was sort of the, the way this read before. It seemed to be you were sort of part of a business of sex trafficking, um, but but it actually defined participation adventure to mean uh, I'm going to assist, uh, promote, facilitate, assist. Uh, again, this really broad idea of what it means 
to um, assist sex trafficking. We know that Congress believes that any that prostitution and sex trafficking are inherently linked. So you could see how someone who maybe assists prostitutes could, in Congress's eyes, also be you necessarily and, and inextricably being assisting sex trafficking. So again, it made that much broader. And then the third thing it did was that it took the existing immunity that um, that internet platforms had under the law. Um, under the law, as a general matter, internet platforms are are not liable for, um, they, they can't bear any legal liability that's based on their act of publishing content that somebody else created. Um, they can only bear legal liability for their own acts that don't have to do with publishing other people's content. Um, and there's exceptions for violations of federal criminal law. So once there's a federal criminal law, there's a big carve out for that. But what, what FOSTA did was that it made further exceptions that not only can you be liable under federal criminal law, but you can also be uh, prosecuted by state, uh, by state attorneys general under similar state laws. And you can also actually be have, uh, have to defend uh, private civil actions uh, by victims. And so again, just the, the prospect of having to face that liability because somebody says that you should have known that uh, this stuff was on your site is, it has a real chilling effect. Uh, because uh, although maybe the big players uh, in the internet platforms who did not oppose the law, um, maybe they can afford to moderate all their content and throw millions of dollars and hiring ten thousands of people to make sure that their that their stuff is on their site. But a lot of the smaller sites, which tend to be used by communities who are ignored or disadvantaged by those big platforms, can afford that type. So we filed a lawsuit um, against the law. Um, we are the, uh, uh, and, and many of you here who are here now sort of were helped us put it together. Um, our our initial tact to, to show how overbroad this law was and how it has consequences way beyond sex trafficking, um, we've started the lawsuit with um, with five uh, plaintiffs. And, and very purposely, none of these are people who themselves advertise sexual services, um, legal or illegal, um, online. Because we wanted to show primarily how this law by that, that um, promoting or facilitating are such broad terms that they reach way beyond the actual offering of sexual services themselves. So um, one of our plaintiffs is the Woodhull Freedom Foundation. Uh, which is a sexual uh, freedom advocacy organization. Among the work that it does is advocate for the decriminalization of sex work and offering uh, health, education, safety resources uh, to sex workers. And, um, and part of what they do, they had just recently, last week, I believe, had their uh, sexual, their annual sexual freedom summit that has a sex work track. They use the internet extensively both to promote um, live stream, and so this idea that they believed they were that they they were uncertain as to whether they could to what extent they could use the internet to promote their sex work track, um, whether that be considered um, making the prostitution of another person easier. Um, I, I think I, that's an obvious reading of the law. Um, another uh, another plaintiff is uh, is um, the sex worker advocate Alex Andrews. Um, who is very active in, uh, who's a board member of SWAP. I believe she's the president of SWAP Orlando and SWAP Behind Bars, uh, Sex Workers Organizing Project. And, and also is the one who maintains the RateThatRescue.org website. So again, here's someone who does harm reduction work, offers health, education, safety resources to, um, to sex workers. Uh, who promotes and encourages and, and tells sex workers who want to be sex workers um, how to do that. Again, someone who could be seen as promoting or facilitating the prostitution of another person. Um, uh, another play we have is Human Rights Watch, again, an international human rights organization that both in this country and abroad does a lot of work on decriminalization of sex work as part of a, large, a larger, broader um, women's rights uh, mandate. Um, and then we, and so those are our, sort of our, our sex work um, organizations that, that advocate for decriminalization, otherwise support sex workers. Then we have two other plaintiffs who are, who, are, who consider themselves outside um, the sex work, uh, sex work uh, field. One is the Internet Archive 
just a, a, a web archive that uh, is, is a library that has as its mission to make sure that this tremendous amount of information that we have on the internet is preserved, uh, that there's historical record and is preserved, and which uh, by default uh, you know, collects and, and, and archives all websites. They're necessarily going to archive things that have bad content in them, and to the extent they are held legally responsible for having and, and, and hosting that content, that's a great threat to their existence. And then lastly, we have someone um, who's just been harmed by the fact that others have started shutting down services because they fear prosecution under FOSTA. Um, and that is, uh, it's, it's a gentleman, he's a, he's a certified non-sexual massage therapist. His sole means of promoting his business and advertising was through Craigslist, through their therapeutic services section, and Craigslist shut that down in their personal sections. Uh, after FOSTA passed, because they could not, um, uh, that because they they couldn't handle otherwise deal with uh, the potential liability. So those are our plaintiffs. That's our lawsuit. We're trying to challenge the entire law. Uh, with that, uh, we asked the court to uh, preliminarily enjoin to put a, a, a stop to the law, just so the court could then take time to determine its constitutionality. Um, that request is under consideration with the judge right now. Uh, the government responded by moving to dismiss our lawsuit, saying that the plaintiffs actually have nothing to fear because the federal government has no intention of prosecuting any of these five organizations or people. Um, and we are uh, right now just waiting for um, waiting for the court to decide. And we'll then move on from there, whatever he does. David, thank you very much for catching us up on all of that. For the work you're doing to tackle this law, we've got sex oh, sex work track around here too, and the sex workers are terrified, terrified, and losing their business and going hungry and freaking out about going on the street. So, and of course, let's just say that there were already sex workers on the street, so that's the thing as well. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I want to get to Ian O'Brien who is going to talk about uh, some of the issues relevant to Prostasia as far as the adult industry is concerned. Am I right? Correct. Please catch us up. All right. Can you hear me? Who's good? I yeah. uh, I've got a script because I don't do things unscripted because I can't uh, be held accountable for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I apologize for my uh, look pants down. Um, but as Cal mentioned, but thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ian O'Brien. I work for the Free Speech Coalition. Um, we're the trade association for the uh, adult film, porn, uh, pleasure product, and sex toys industries. Um, uh, uh, we deal with sexual content, products, devices, technologies, innovations, um, but frequently we're homogenized as the adult industry. Um, uh, I can't think of another industry that is uh, more explicitly identified in its opposition to what children are. Um, there, are <laughs> there are a variety of other occupations and industries and products that like, uh, have political and social boundaries around them, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, war, um, but none as like, explicit in like, its opposition to youth and children as the adult industry um, and people who peddle in sexuality. Uh, part of that's for a good reason. Um, there are tangible consequences for sexual expression, um, both innate to, to sexuality, with sexual health, um, violence, uh, abuse, um, and, and culturally imagined. Um, and even more so when sex becomes a means of work. Uh, in porn, um, I in fact have a, a lot of very sex positive colleagues, and I mean that in the uh, both, way. both, both <laughs> ways. <laughs> both the we and the like, we should have access to sexuality in our own terms. Um, who do believe that uh, adult film, um, that even the age of 18 is too young for people to, to fully comprehend the decision that uh, the cultural significance of um, and impacts that a, that a career in uh, sex work would have on your life? Um, there are really tangible consequences there. Uh, the power of and risk of sex, um, uh, again, both innate and culturally imagined, uh, must be acknowledged. Like, they're real. But they don't have to be kowtowed to, um, as we see in the legislation against Estapasta and um, in the history of the Free Speech Coalition. Um, 
Uh, our history is mostly in our name, the Free Speech Coalition. Uh, a lot of our work has been done around uh, accessing uh, the uh, ability for, for uh, porn or sexual content, um, both in terms of toys or, or film, to exist. Um, uh, and the battles have been primarily existential. Uh, does sexual content get to exist, and if so, in what capacity? Um, in the United States, it does have a right, um, at least in California and New Hampshire. Uh, <laughs> complicated. Um, uh, and it's been secured, but there's a lot of caveats. Um, uh, one of the most notorious ongoing battles has been the Child Protection and Obscenity Enforcement Act of 1988, um, which has been colloquially known uh, through its enforcement as uh, Section 2257. Um, we recently won a major victory against 2257. This is, again, going on since 1988. Um, uh, but it's a, in its original conceptualization, um, 2257 uh, was a law in which producers of adult content and anyone who distributed that content far down the supply chain uh, were required to keep physical and publicly available, which is a key component of this, uh, records of performers' legal names, age, um, addresses, and uh, a variety of other personal information, um, which, uh, uh, while it was done in name, again, to protect children, um, uh, exposed a lot of people to a lot of potential risk and abuse. Um, and uh, one thing that I think is important to point out explicitly is that like, sex workers have children. And so we put a sex worker at risk, you also put their children at risk. So um, uh, adverse effects, different uh, levels. Um, but much of, much of this law has been struck down. Um, uh, we recently won another victory, uh, as I mentioned. Um, so now secondary distributors of content no longer have to, well, most likely no longer have to keep records. I, I want to put in caveats there because there's a lot of uh, uh, confusion and uh, still to be determined who that applies to within the legislation, so if anybody's out here who's producing pornography content, keep plug complying with 2257 until we can get like clear guidance on what you're doing. I'm not a lawyer, I'm just lawyer critical. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we've got this for you if you need it. But, uh, um, but uh, uh, these victories really represent like a move of jurisprudence towards the acknowledgement of sex as something uh, uh, unexceptional. Um, we want laws and policies that protect children in reality and not uh, fighting of Saj um, at the expense of people who might be raising children themselves. Um, so a lot of that is not uh, uh, de-exceptionalizing sex work. It's not a, a new concept. It's a lot of what we're talking about. It's a lot of what we're fighting for. Um, uh, and, but it does have its fallbacks. And um, I, I think we're really tangibly seeing that as an organization now. Uh, like while we have had this existential fight in the past, and as we like uh, what sexuality means and if it needs to exist, or how the terms in which it gets to exist um, uh, on a moral level, or something that we've 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 tackled, um, we're getting into like more nuanced conversations about uh, uh, the pragmatism of sexual health, how that plays out, what does regulation look like. So my professional and academic background is in public health. Um, uh, prior to working at the Free Speech Coalition, I actually worked here in San Francisco at um, what is now the Gender and Sexualities Alliance Network, um, the Gay Straight Alliance Network then, uh, doing uh, work around uh, children's sexual health, um, uh, LGBT students' sexual health primarily, um, in, via anti-bullying campaigns. Um, I've also worked on international and national campaigns around sexual health uh, and organizing um, as a means of gaining like LGBT rights. Um, and I think health has become this really interesting category for sexuality uh, to, to organize around, to utilize. It's, a, um, it's a, a morally, what I've been calling a morally absolute category. You can't argue with health. Um, if you're doing something in the name of health, uh, you're doing something good. Um, uh, it's unexceptional. Um, and so much work has been justified under that. Like, uh, a lot of the LGBT movement, uh, its basis is on the back of, I mean, the AIDS crisis, certainly, um, as a moment of uh, uh, critical, like, organization. But, um, but like, 
that we are dying pay attention to us, um, health becomes this moment of people paying attention. It isn't sex. It's, it's uh, something beyond, something we can all relate to. Um, however, the, the absolution in naming health is also a double-edged sword. Um, there has been an increasing rise in the past since of duplicitous rhetoric uh, that names pornography as a public health crisis. Um, multiple states have passed legislation, um, or not legislation, um, what word am I looking for? Uh, resolution, there we go, thanks boss. Um, uh, <laughs> that by claiming pornography is a public health crisis. Um, so employing health as a, a political framework allows socially conservative morality to be imposed against civil liberties by disguising it as a universally recognized project of uh, public good. Um, in a world where facts are regularly questioned, uh, that's a dangerous reality. So we're not, we're not dealing with the unexceptional here, we're dealing with the unexceptional being exceptionalized. So uh, trying to approach sexuality from a, from a flat affect, so to speak, um, as uh, the, the boring and mundane actually puts it at risk of uh, those same tactics. Um, uh, perhaps the most prominent contemporary attempts to, to pathologize pornography are in framing it as addictive. Um, despite many years of research that has failed to conclude that people distraught by their pornographic content uh, fits clinical, uh, psychometric, or physiological models of addiction. Um, in fact, there's a lot of growing statistical evidence that the shame imparted from the use of addiction framework um, is primarily responsible for the reported psychological distress. Um, so meaning, if you're told that uh, porn is addictive, um, and that porn is bad, and then you view porn, you're going to think of yourself as a bad person and think you're addicted to porn. Um, uh, the, what we have, uh, we certainly know, is that porn is not what we call a, a super normal stimulus. Um, so something that there's like a, a single exaggerated response to. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of a super normal stimulus. Uh, like if you get punched, it's going to hurt. Right, like, like we all experience that, we know what's going to happen. Um, if you're allergic to something and you eat peanut butter, or you're allergic to peanut butter, you eat peanut butter, you have an allergic reaction. There's no, um, we know everybody that's allergic to peanut butter is going to have that reaction. There's no super normal stimulus for pornography. There's like different relationships to it. Um, and so we can use the rhetoric of health to like show that, or, or claim that uh, there are negative health outcomes here, but there's not, it's not a, a population level uh, stimulus. There's no single effect. In fact, there's some evidence that like porn might have an ameliorative, uh, ameliorating effect against uh, violence in some communities. Um, so, uh, like, uh, in essence, like sex and, and sex work are both exceptional and unexceptional. Um, it is both mundane and has immense cultural power and significance. Um, People who consume porn can have can have a pathological uh, relationship to it, but they can also have a mundane relationship to it, and they can also have a healing relationship to it. Um, in the adult industry and in the in the sex industries, uh, we need people to understand both the unique imaginations and possibilities of our workers. Like there are there are aspects of porn and and sex work in general that liberate people's lives in ways that they couldn't access in other industries. Um, but also, they need health insurance and uh, uh, basic protections and workplace safety. Um, and they care just as deeply about protecting their families and their children as anyone else. Um, we need both the facts and moral theorizing. And so I'm uh, proud that Prestigia has the uh, courage to work in both those fields. Thank you so much, Ian. Sorry, it took me a second. <laughs> I wasn't trying to decide whether to thank you. <laughs> and it was actually a terrific intro to things that I'm going to talk about later. But first, but first, uh, I'm really delighted to introduce um, Megan. And I just clicked away from the thing with your Last name, Megan? Ingerman. Ingerman, right. I was going to say Ingleside. I was like, that's wrong. <laughs> it's a BART station. I can't be right. <laughs> right. 
Megan, I want to ask you a few <laughs> questions. Okay. Uh, Megan is going to talk about some of the issues that we are addressing tonight from the perspective of kink and sex work related communities. I am the kinky one. And nobody else here is kinky. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Hi, I'm the only kinky one. <laughs> mm. That's not in all of San Francisco. Possibly, <laughs> possibly the kinkiest one. I, I can't find a way to argue about that. All right, I've got a few questions for you. Can I, can I go to lunch? All right. Megan, you have quite a unique skill set. Your biography says that you're a child care and child development specialist, and that you've also been an organizer and education, educator in the organized kink community. Has your professional background taught you anything about how children think or act that's been useful in considering how to prevent them from being sexually abused? So it's definitely an interesting sort of nexus because you think child protection and kink, two great tastes that don't taste great together. Um, but there's definitely, let's see. So the way I approach child care uh, was actually in some ways informed by the way I was taught by the kink community and vice versa. Um, so consent is a hugely important thing in the kink community, in your sex life in general. And I think that doesn't get taught to children in like a really coherent way until they're not children anymore. And so that's how we have so many adults walking around with no idea of exactly what consent means. And so I teach kids, because I work mostly with infants and toddlers, so I get in at the you know ground level. Um, and it's consent for everything from like if I don't if they don't want to give an adult a hug then I don't like to force that kind of thing like I've had parents so I often go by Miss Megan when I'm working usually only with kids um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, give Miss Megan a hug say hi I'm like, it's okay if that's not where we're at this morning that's fine um, but so I think consent is probably the biggest dovetail for me between child care and the kink world. And I think that's what I have to say on that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second question, actually, I think you just answered. Are there, are there um, lessons or teaching that you've taken away from that community that have been important when thinking about child protection? Anything further? Uh, I mean, so the kink community is really uh, my kink community. I can't speak for every kink community. Uh, I'm not a facts and figures kind of person. Uh, but I can speak for my kink community, and we're very, uh, so consent is like the number one thing you hear when you start going to munches, which is often where you start in the kink community. Uh, you go to little organized events where you start talking to people and learning about what your kinks are, that sort of thing. Um, and so consent is the first thing you hear, and we're very good at making sure everybody is at least 18 or older. So. Um, like I said, it doesn't seem like they would dovetail, but there are things there that dovetail. What is the kink community's attitude toward minors that may attempt to be part of the community, either online or in real life? What kind of interventions can adults make when they may encounter a minor online seeking to be included? So, I mentioned uh, we're not big on having minors at our events. It's pretty important to us. Uh, and so. The term gatekeeping has a bad rap, and in a lot of cases, it deserves it. You know, gatekeeping, say, bisexual people from like this. Uh, so it used to be common <laughs> for gay and lesbian people to sort of gatekeep against bisexuals, and I'm getting way off topic here. But anyway, uh, we Still do. happens. <laughs> we do. Yes, it does. Um, all the time. Bi erasure is a whole other thing I could talk about for hours. Um, <laughs> but so. Uh, we do a pretty good job in a lot of ways of gatekeeping against minors in kink because, so personally, it's very important. I don't associate with other kinksters for whom it isn't important as well. And so there are things like FetLife has, I believe, recently added some new protections or ways to report minors using uh, the website, FetLife being Fetish Life or anybody who's uninitiated. Uh, which is basically kinky Facebook. Um, but so also any kink organization that I've ever been a part of, there have always been rules about everyone has to be at least 18 or older to join any of our events, to come to our munches, no matter how uh, casual your interest might be, it's always, that's great, 
please come back when you're 18. And in some cases, it's actually been 19 and older. There was SM Odyssey, there's still SM Odyssey in the South Bay. Um, they're not as much of a presence as they used to be, but their rule was 19 and older to avoid things like a student ever meeting their teacher, like an, act, an actual high school student meeting their teacher at an event. Um, but so we do what we can, uh, and we really don't encourage minors and kink. There's a certain amount of grooming that seems like it would be obvious, especially between like the, you know, if you're getting into BDSM, the dominant submissive, you know, a younger submissive seems like, oh, that's great, I can group. But we really frown on that. <laughs> and anybody who's playing ethically is not doing that sort of thing. And so my thing when I encounter minors in kink is, first of all, that's great that you're interested. Please come back when you're 18. Here are some books to read. Because I'm actually not opposed to giving them material to read. I think education is so incredibly key. Because how can you know about how to interact with a kink community that you might be interested in if you have no concept of what any of this means? And so there are some great books, there are some great resources, and so I try to use everything as a teaching moment. Um, but so I think the organized kink community is part of what protects minors from the abuse that is so, uh, that can so easily be a huge part of that. And of course there's, I'm going that list here. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a difference between the organized kink community and kinky people on the hoof running around. Right, right? absolutely. I mean, so outside of the organized kink community, you've got, and this is why I like having a community. It gives me, you know, people to bounce stuff off of and to, to offer more protection, honestly, to minors, because you know, the more organized you are, the better the education, stuff like that. But so, like, I'm pretty active on sites like Tumblr, where you've got less of a, you've got your Tumblr community, but you've got less of an organized, like, kink community. And even there, there's a sense of, like, so where, like, the younger people, still not minors, but younger people, the sites that they're using, uh, it's very prevalent, the no one under 18, the, you know, please come back when you're old enough, like, we're interested, but, and the giving out of resources. And so there are also websites like that where you can glean quite a bit of information, some of it actually really good. Obviously, when you're on the internet a lot, it's going to be, oh my gosh, what am I reading? Uh, but there is some good information in that way, too, and you can kind of glean it without, so if you were a minor, you shouldn't be here. Um, but uh, there's information out there that they can glean, kind of running amok in the wilds of the internet that is actually pretty sound, so. One last question. Role play is a big part of some kinky practices. And this is part of what makes BDSM controversial to some because it includes role playing of potentially abusive behaviors, at least viewed from the outside. How do you think that each party to a scene can get something positive out of what would be negative in real life? How do you how do you talk about that when you're explaining to outsiders or So this is another one where like some people come at it with facts and figures and they don't have numbers for you. What I can talk to you about is my own experience as a victim of sexual abuse and as a kinkster, and the literally hundreds of people that I've spoken to who have found some healing in their kink life. Because it is huge for somebody who's been through, because the thing that you lose in a situation that involves sexual abuse is control. Your own agency, like somebody has taken your body, your soul, every part of you to use for themselves in a way that you didn't consent to. And so it's hugely powerful and incredibly helpful for a lot of people to be able to play out even that scenario, even down to like what that person said in a way that you're in control of. So to be able to look at your sexual abuse situation and negotiate with somebody who you know you can trust to stop when you say stop, whatever your safe word is, to stop when you say stop, to give you the power to, even in some cases, Reimagine the outcome. Maybe the outcome that you actually wanted was that you kicked him in the nuts and ran away. And to be able to role play that and so that you can feel empowered, so that the situation went, so you can re-cement it in your mind as something that happened that you had some control over. To just assert your control over that situation can be incredibly healing for people. And I think it's really unfortunate that, so what you hear a lot is rape play. Uh, I don't actually generally call it that. I do amongst people who know what I'm talking about, but generally I speak in terms of consensual non-consent because that absolutely is a thing. 
Um, and so to have the power of a consensual non-consent scene where things are happening to, because also a lot of victims of sexual abuse are kinksters, are considered sexual deviants, like already, and that's part of how their sexual abuse happened. Um, because they ended up in a scene where somebody thought that it was all bets are off, and oh, they're into this, so I can do whatever I want, safe words were ignored, mistakes were made, things were said. Um, and so, <laughs> sorry, uh, this is a little bit of a hard topic. Um, but so it's unfortunate to me that so many people see things like that, or BDSM community, or whatever, and think sexual deviance. They have nothing to say about this subject. They're the ones who make this kind of thing happen. They make children unsafe. The reality is that we're actually very conscientious. <laughs> Most of us. I can't speak for every single kinky person in the whole world. Uh, boy, that would be a lot of work. Um, <laughs> uh, but like I said, I can speak for myself, and when I do speak to outsiders, to vanillas, or however they identify, um, what I like to talk about is that there's an educational side to this, there's the... I find that when I talk to vanilla people, they tend to not... And I, is there a better term for vanilla? Just okay. not kinky? Yeah. Okay. I don't want to be offensive in any way. There's nothing wrong with vanilla. If your favorite thing in the world is missionary sex, that's fine. You're um, not saying it in a snarky tone of voice, <laughs> so I think you're good. Oh my god, vanilla is... No. Um, <laughs> no, but so what I often find when I speak to vanilla people is that they don't have a strong concept of consent. Because they haven't had to exercise it in the same way. There's that... Um, we met in a bar, I slid my hand up her knee, she was okay with it, that means it was fine. But like realistically there was a consent violation there because you didn't know her and you didn't ask her, so the fact that she was okay with it doesn't change the fact that there was a consent violation. So for me, to kind of sum everything up, because I've gotten a little off topic, uh, the thing that's important to me about Prestasia and the reason that I'm involved with Prostasia is because teaching children consent early means that they walk through life knowing about it and so they are more likely to understand their own agency and the rights of their bodies and that gives them a better chance of protection. Sex positivity gives us things like better sex ed in schools which also helps protect children from sexual abuse. The more you know about your body, the more you know about your own agency, the better protected you are. Um, the less we stigmatize all forms of sex, kink, whatever, the more protection there is. Because if it's stigmatized, you're not learning about it. So I think that's kind of my whole thing here. <laughs> May, thank you so much. I am especially uh, delighted that Megan spoke from a first-person perspective because, of course, so many of us have walked in the world in situations that have some relevance to the work that Prestige is trying to do. So thank you for, for doing that. I, I want to say a little bit about my own experience, um, which is... That, well, one, I was a frisky teenager, there were adults, you do the math. So there's that. But that, I think, is not the, the important thing that I have to share in this context. Um, some of you in the room might know uh, that I've led a checkered career, <laughs> sexologist by day, for a while, sex worker by night, or actually it was the other way around many times. But one of the things that uh, was extraordinary to me about doing sex work, my mother told me that men only wanted one thing. What did she know? Men wanted so many different things, as it turned out. And because I was already studying sexology, that was extraordinary, getting to to interface with people in their fantasies and the, the sexuality that, that had grown up diversely among them. That was an extraordinary privilege. Uh, nothing in the language of Sesta Foster acknowledges that that might be somebody's response, but 
I mean, the, nobody trafficked me, or if they did, I trafficked myself. Except, well, depending on how you look at trafficking, I did have a madam. And one day the madam called me up, this is before we got text messages about such things, and said, I've got some work for you, can you come over to my place? She had a little spare room in her place where the work was done. And uh, she usually told me what color of lingerie to wear, because some people have preferences, favorite color and all that. <laughs> and she said, today, I want you to dress young. And I said, how young? She said, really young. So I did, in fact, have some Mary Janes. I did have some white cotton underwear left over from a more innocent time of my life. And I dressed young, thinking there's got to be a fetishist on the other side of this encounter. What will I experience? And there was indeed a fetishist on the other side of the encounter, um, or possibly a pedophile. I'm not really sure, um, except that after we had had our scene, there was time when he came out of his character, expected that I would come out of my character, because these scenes are theatrical in nature. BDSM scenes are, sex play scenes often are. If you're, if you're playing a role, you're playing a role. Yeah. <laughs> and what he said to me was, you know, a long time ago, I actually used to do stuff with girls, teenagers and stuff, and I didn't, I didn't think it was harmful. I loved them. I, I didn't want to hurt them. But then I read an article, I think he said it was in Psychology Today. Thank you, Psychology Today for covering everything over the years. He said, I read an article about the effects that it might have on people as they grew up and their sexuality and everything. And, and that's what I wanted. I, I didn't understand that part. And I resolved that I would stop. And so now, I call women like you to help me make this happen in a fantasy context. He didn't say the words, I think this helps me not reoffend, but I got that loud and clear from him. I hope that's real for him. I hope that's his real story in terms of the notion that he could actually take into fantasy life what he understands he should never do again in real skin-to-skin -skin life. And I just want to say, in, in closing my story, that that's exactly the way sexologists who have, have been brave enough to go to this particular zone of research talk about and assume fantasy can be used. So when Jeremy talked to me about this possibility that, that research could happen around child sexual abuse and prevention modalities. I thought of my professor Loretta Haroyan, may she rest in power, who was the first human being I heard talk about people as though they were human beings who could be affected by information people like this guy. And I hope that that's right. I guess we'll find out. And it's a great honor for me to be able to host this gathering, which I think is so important, and to be able to tell you uh, that I've had one, count on one, encounter with someone who I really believe was trying to take in information and change their behavior accordingly. May there be many, many more people like that that are touched by the work that you all do. And uh, with that, 
I think I want to find out, Jeremy, what has any last words. Do you? Not really, but thank you for that message of hope. I think we have a question from the audience. How about we take a couple of questions? Well, I mean, Come up and, uh, and take the microphone if you wouldn't mind. You, you can stay here, but you'll have to shout because we have a, a film. Um, I can I can try to to, to recap. So okay. let, let me do that and just tell me if I did okay. Well, All right. It's going to be kind of a complicated question. Okay, let's go for it. Um, so I uh, I have a group. On Wait, here comes a mic. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I I uh, and a group of friends are all interested in. Um, what I call alternative parenting, which is like sex positive parenting, um, polyamorous parenting, parenting from different sexual identities, um, parenting in various alternative ways, platonic co-parenting, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I personally have a background with extensive BDSM activism um, and speaking. I uh, gave a talk at the Center for Sex and Culture years ago. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, I'm a huge supporter of EFF, huge supporter of the Center for Sex and Culture. Was really excited to see this organization come up. Um, and that's why I'm here. And I promoted it to a bunch of people I know. So, and I, I just want to pass on something that I heard from someone because I'm curious about your, uh, your response to this thing. They sent it in an email. Um, and I, I got this email like an hour before I came. So I haven't had that much time to digest it myself. Um, but it was... It was kind of an intense email to receive. This is a friend of mine who's also very sex positive. She's a mom. Um, she's like, in general, really on board with these sites. She's a huge supporter of the EFF, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and she said, I'm a little nervous about this organization for my impression of what they've written on Medium and things like the people who they follow on Twitter, obvious pedophiles who declare themselves as such. My impression is that this is people who want to give credibility to pedophilia or febophilia by doing things like encouraging pedophiles to be out and doing stuff like legalizing child sex robots. That sounds ridiculous when I write it, but that's their angle. I have to question if fighting for our rights to make sex bots that look like children is a good approach to things. I get that there could be an ethical gray area and people are pervy in various ways, but it strikes me as unsavory. That's my two cents. What do you think if you look over Jeremy's articles? And then she gave me like a list of articles. And then she was like, I was a bit shocked to see the Center for Sex with Culture hosting this, so it was really wild to see it come in from you in your parenting group. And so, again, this is not, like, this is someone I know speaking. Like, I read the articles. Um, I thought they were really interesting and well-balanced. Um, in my experience, as someone who has written and spoken and lectured on, like, wide varieties of human sexuality, I have had people come to me and talk to me about their sexual fantasies. And sometimes those fantasies have involved children. Um, and when I've talked to people who have those fantasies, I've had no reason to think that they're committing crimes in real life. And typically they've expressed an enormous amount of shame and asked for help in understanding what is going on with them. So. My sort of instinctual perspective is to try and understand what you could do to help people like this, how you could take a fact-based approach and protect children in a way that is evidence-based and doesn't stigmatize people who haven't actually done anything wrong. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> the whole exchange was really, really shook me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that is a very intense question, you're right. Um, and I think that that kind of concern is likely to be shared by other people. Um, we do have a culture in which, um, you've probably heard of the, you know, the QAnon uh, conspiracy theories that are going around and the pizza game and stuff like this. So the concept of um, there being people in our society who have a sexual attraction to children or to, um, to, to adolescents is something that freaks people out so much that they kind of shut their brains down a little and don't look at it in a what I would consider a rational fact-based way. And the, the rational way that I like to look at it is, according to science, there are people who have this sexual attraction. It's normally not something that they want. It's definitely not something that they've chosen. Um, according to the research that exists, it's kind of uh, something that they discover 
in themselves and would rather not have. Um, so amongst those group of people, who are not the majority of sexual offenders against children, by the way, it's a minority of people who offend against children who actually are pedophiles or ephebophiles, um, they have a choice. They have the choice to offend or not to offend. So what Prostasia is doing, uh, we don't work directly with them. We do work with researchers and with other groups who, who um, may counsel these people. Um, and, and what we try to promote is the idea of steering as many of them as possible away from offending. And sometimes that does involve um, providing them with peer support services, professional support services, information, education. So this does make some people uncomfortable, but it's actually something that I believe in very firmly and I stand by. Um, and I think our record uh, in terms of um, the advisors and the directors of Prostasia kind of speaks for itself. Where we're coming from speaks for itself. Um, and I'm happy to engage in this sort of conversation with people who do have questions like that. And um, I actually welcome them to, to engage with us and to set their own minds at, at ease because it is a difficult topic. And so I thank you for bringing that question um, this evening. Would anyone else like to add anything to that? Actually, um, so especially, I only one. <laughs> especially regarding, say, things like childlike sex robots, that one is really easy to have a knee jerk reaction to. I spent more than 10 years in child care. I care very much about caring for children and uh, protecting them. And so for me, that's definitely one where like my knee jerk is like, oh my God, we can't, like, no, that's not okay. Uh, but the reality is that we don't have the research to know if that would keep somebody from offending. And personally, I'd rather have and this, even a position like this can be misconstrued and sound wrong to people, but I'd rather have somebody with a childlike robot than an actual child. If it keeps somebody from actually offending, from keeping in mind that this is an attraction that they can't necessarily, I don't want to say control, because that sounds like then any kid who walks by they have to jump on them. Not like that. But you don't have a ton of control over what you're um, just instinctually into. And you don't know actually that it's wrong until society tells you that it's wrong. Um, so for minor attracted people, it's, uh, like, as far as we know, the vast majority are not offenders. It's just that we only hear about the offenders. There are a lot of people with these kinds of attractions. And so the thing to take away from things like Creeper and child sex, and the things that really strike you with that knee jerk of like, no, 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 that's not okay is to keep in mind that there isn't a lot of research about this stuff. And without the research, maybe the research will show that, no, this is absolutely a terrible idea. Oh my God, what were we doing? But until we have the research to know, then we're just kind of taking a shot in the dark and not actually protecting children, so. I just want to add that I think we're living in a time when people are frequently willing to think that making policy based on belief is a good idea. I'm not sure that's correct. And I think that when we get as much knowledge as possible, I mean, again, this is a core principle of sexology, that trying to understand the often stigmatized range of human sexuality is a valuable project that allows for more useful ways of intervening in things that are problematic and may eventually help us to figure out ways to deconstruct homophobia and transphobia and biphobia. You know, there it came phobia. There, there, are, there are so many reasons for us to appreciate research around any kind of sexuality. And what Jeremy said about, about research about child sexual offenders is quite correct. There's not as much as we would like to see. There's not a lot of funding for almost any sex research, unless there's going to be a pill that someone can send at the cell at the end. Or in some cases, there's a clear sexual health um, intervention that can come out of it at the end. If it doesn't have to do with sex, 
and or pharmacology, getting money to do sex research is really problematic. And that allows so many of us in this uh, different belief laden community in which we now reside in this country to, to believe that antipathy is the same thing as knowledge. In some cases, that might prove to be true. In other cases, antipathy doesn't stop the problem. And that's what makes me feel as though this is a worthwhile use of the Center for Sex and Culture space. We'd like to see real movement that really makes a difference in people's lives. Well, uh, unless we have any other questions, I think we are, since we will be only brought to this space for another few minutes, I think it's time for us to... Uh, you to don't have to race out into the night <laughs> immediately, please. There's still some nibbles back there. There are indeed nibbles, there are indeed drinks. Thank you very much. Take a brochure, take some stickers, um, sign yourself up to our mailing list. Um, there's a sign-up form on the front desk. Um, thank you once again, and can we have a round of applause for these speakers? <laughs>